They told us in preaching school the best way to capture an audience's attention is to stand there and don't say a word. I feel way too awkward to do it much longer than I already have, so let me get started. I heard of a story on one occasion of a preacher who was known to go to be long-winded. And right before church one day, his daughter says, Daddy, how do you know when it's time to finish preaching? And um, he said, Honey, well, the way I know is we don't have a clock at the back of the church building. We voted last month to take that down. So here's how I know when it's time to finish preaching. There's a man in our audience... And he always wears a, a wristwatch. And when, when Mr. Smith, when he starts looking at his wristwatch, you know you've got about five minutes left in the sermon. And then she said, well, Daddy, how do you know when that five minutes is up? He said, well, honey, well, you get to looking at Mr. Smith, and, and all of a sudden, he's, at some point, he's no longer looking at his watch, but he's looking at me, and he's looking at his watch, and he's pointing like this right here. She said, Daddy, how do you know when you go overboard in your preaching? And he says, well, then Mr. Smith is back there waving his hand, wondering if his watch is broke or if it's still working. She said, Daddy, I think we need to put that clock back on the back wall. Well, they voted again, and they put the clock back on the back wall. And he knew that in, within so many minutes of the sermon beginning, that members were going to start looking up at that clock on the back wall, so he was ready, and he put a sign underneath the clock that said, Remember Lot's wife. <laughs> you know, I've seen a church where that's happened before. I've seen a church where a, a deacon jokingly put a sign up, and when the preacher stood to speak, he burst out laughing, and the congregation was so confused. You know, when I think about the time that a, ser that a preacher preaches, I'm reminded of another story that I heard that's more serious in nature. It was an old gospel preacher. I think I know who it was, but I'm drawing a blank as to what his name is, so let me uh, just say it was some random gospel preacher of long ago. And it was before modern technology, and here's what he was doing on that particular lesson on that Sunday night. He was going to be preaching about the second coming of Jesus. And one of the main points that he was going to be making was how that we will not be given signs when Jesus will come again. He will come as a thief in the night when we least expect Him in a day and in an hour where no one really knows. And so as a demonstration of this truth, he gets up before the congregation, even before he says a word, and he's holding an old alarm clock in his hand, the wind-up kind, and he hands it to a sister in the first roll or two, and he says, Sister so-and-so, I'm going to hand you this clock. You wind it up to any number of minutes you want to, and you have my word that whenever the alarm on that clock goes off, the sermon will be done. I will not say a single word. Even if I'm in mid-sentence, the sermon will be over. So you can really do us all a favor if you would set that clock. Well... He tells the story by saying that she wasn't too mean. She didn't set it for one or five minutes or even ten. But she really didn't want to sit there all night, so she said it what he remembered to be about twelve minutes of time. Now, he didn't know how long this was going to be. And as soon as he hands her the clock and she starts winding, he then goes on to explain, whenever this clock goes off, I'm going to abruptly end my sermon, so let me tell you the most important thing right now, in case I never get to... And in about a minute's time, he explained that Jesus will one day come again. He will come in a moment that we least expect Him, much like the conclusion of this sermon. And here's what we need to do to become Christians and be ready for that day. And he goes down the points. In case I don't get to it at the end of the sermon, that's what you need to do. And when the alarm goes off, the song of invitation will be sung. And if you're outside of Christ, you come forward at that alarm. Now, I can promise you this, as uncomfortable as that may have been right there in that service, do you think 30 or 40 years later people still remember that sermon? Probably so. The passage that is before us this evening is addressing the second coming of Jesus Christ, and it's found in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And in 1 John chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, what I find interesting is he begins talking about the second coming of Jesus, and there he, he gets us to start thinking about what the second coming of Jesus will be like. 
Now I know what the Bible says about the basic truths that Jesus will one day come in the clouds with His mighty host of angels, with the trump of God and the shout of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then those of us who are alive and remain shall be called up together with Him in the sky. We will have a great reunion and thus go on and be in heaven for all eternity. Of course, judgment takes place at that time. But the question that I have is not so much about those details, but what will my personal experience be like on that day? What will I be doing? Will I be sitting at the house eating dinner with my family? Will I be driving down the road? Will I be getting ready to go to work? Will I be dead asleep in the middle of the night? Will I be at the office preparing for another work day? What will my day be like when I hear the shout and hear the trumpet and see the scene that I have never could imagine in a million years? What will my personal experience be like in all of this? And here's the question even further. When judgment actually happens, and here's a caveat, I don't necessarily know how this is going to play out. I think Scripture oversimplifies this process for us because of the limitations of us being in the material material universe, but when I do experience the judgment, how will I feel? Will I be trembling with fear? Will I be overcome with gladness? Will I have a degree of shame? Will I have a degree of a lack of confidence? What will my personal experience be like when I know that I'm finally in the presence of Jesus Christ, the judge of all the universe? And that is what John addresses here in these last two verses of 1 John chapter 2. Read it with me. The Bible says, And now, little children, abide in Him that when He appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. He says in verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. I remember when I first read this ver these verses in a way that resonated with me. I was in preaching school. And I remember preparing a sermon on the idea of abiding in Christ. And I came across this passage. And for some reason, I don't know what it was, a misunderstanding on my part. For some reason, I always viewed standing before Christ on Judgment Day as a fearful thing in which I, I would not have a great deal of assurance. But you remember why John is writing through the inspiration of this book in 1 John chapter 1. He says, I'm writing these things that your joy may be full. And now at the conclusion of chapter 2, he's saying the second coming of Christ doesn't need to be a fearful occasion. If we are in Christ, the second coming is not a day in which we will stand before Him ashamed of all the wrong that we've committed. If we are in Christ, then the second coming is one, is an event in which we can stand there proudly, confidently, with boldness, without any shame whatsoever. And that isn't because I've just lived that perfect of a life. That's because of how wonderful the grace of God is. And so let me offer for you very, three very simple points for why we can one day stand before God on the day of judgment with confidence and assurance instead of fear. I want you to notice in the first place that he says in verse number 28 of 1 John chapter 2, and now little children, just a side note, he's writing to those who were his quote, children in the faith. Maybe he converted them. Maybe he was simply their teacher. They were probably somewhat less mature spiritually than he was, and he saw himself like a spiritual father to them, not replacing God the Father, but like a spiritual role model. And he says, now little children, here's the first thing you need to do in order to have that confidence and not be ashamed at the second coming. He says, you need to, what's it say, church family, verse 28, abide in Him. Now, if you remember, in our study of the book of 1 John so far, we've talked a few times about this word abide. And as a reminder, this word abide from the original means to make something our dwelling place, for something to be our abode, for us to find something and go lodge there and make it our place of residence. And if I'm going to stand before Christ on the day of judgment with this 
confidence, not in myself, but in His ability to save me, then it's going to be because I have made Christ my dwelling place. It is going to be because I have, I have chosen to lodge in the teachings of Christ. Now, look back with me at chapter 2. If you will notice in chapter 2 in verse number 6, abiding in Christ means that we walk as Christ walked. Do you see that there in chapter 2 in verse number 6? He says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. And so sub-point number one is this, that abiding in Christ, what does that look like? It means that I'm following the example that Jesus left. I'm living the way He lived. I'm treating, the people, the, I'm treating people the way that He treated them. I'm having the mindset of Jesus Christ and the attitude of Christ and demonstrating the love of Christ. If I'm abiding in Him, I'm living as He lived. I'm walking as He walked. And if I'm doing this, then I can one day have the confidence when I stand before Him in Judgment Day that I have nothing to be ashamed of. I've been redeemed. I've been justified. I've been cleansed. I've been saved. And I know that I know that I know that heaven will be my home. Point number one, because I know where I've been abiding. Here's what the Bible says in chapter 2 and verse number 10. Abiding in the light requires me to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. Notice chapter 2 and verse number 10. The Bible says here, let's back up to verse number 9. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Verse 10, he who loves his brother, underline it, abides in the light and there is no cause of stumbling in him. All we're doing is going back in this particular context and letting the Bible further define what this word abide means and what is connected to the idea of abiding in Christ. And so if I'm to stand before Him in confidence on the day of judgment, I must abide in Christ. Subpoint one, which means I walk as He walked. Subpoint two, that means that I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. Notice verse 14 of the same chapter. Abiding in God on this occasion means that His word is abiding in us. In verse number 14 of chapter 2, he's quoting the passage which says, I have written to you fathers because of you, because you have known him who is from the beginning, underline it, I have written to you young men because you are strong, underline it, and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. First of all, notice that overcoming the wicked one means that we need to have the word of God abiding in us. And so as the word abide means that we make Christ our dwelling place, if the word is abiding in us, the word finds a dwelling place in our heart. It's very similar to what David said in Psalm 119 when he said, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. The word of God takes residence in our mind and in our heart, and it helps us to defeat the temptations of the devil. And of course, here's what he's saying, that if I abide in Christ, which means I walk as He walked, which means I love my brothers and sisters in Christ, which means that His Word, the Scriptures, are abiding in me. If I'm abiding in Christ, one day when Jesus comes again, I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be uncertain. I don't have to live with that uncertainty and fear because God's Word gives me the comfort that I can stand there confident and not be ashamed. Here's point number two. How can I stand before Christ on the judgment day and have that confidence and assurance and not be ashamed? Number one, I do so by abiding in Christ. Number two, notice verse 29 of our text. I do so by knowing that He, God, is righteous. The Bible says in verse number 29, if you know that He, God, is righteous, and then we'll continue the point in just a moment. I just got to make this observation. The word righteous, especially in connection to the character and nature of God, means that God is fair. He is not a respecter of persons or showing partiality. It means that God is just. He has a set of rules and He's fair as He emphasizes those rules and holds people accountable to those rules. It means that He is right. He is more right than anything ever was right. It means also that He is dependent 
dependable. And so in short, when I'm standing there on the judgment day, and I know that I'm imperfect, I know that I've committed sins, I know that on occasion I've rebelled against God and treated my fellow man in a way that was not becoming of the nature of Christ. I know that I'm imperfect. But if I have chosen to abide in Christ and thus receive the forgiveness that that entails, and I know that I'm washed and I'm sanctified and I'm clean, and I'm standing there before Christ on Judgment Day, however that will look, I have confidence not because I'm that good, but because my God is that trustworthy. And if He tells me that I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven! And if He tells me that anyone who believes, repents, confesses, and is baptized will have their sins washed away, be placed on the path of light, and be forgiven and cleansed and made holy, then He is trustworthy every time. And as I'm standing there on Judgment Day, I do not need to have this doubt because He who is judge of everybody is the most just and reliable being that the world has ever known. I stand there with confidence because of Him. And that's point number two, very simply. Here's a third and final point. It's also found in verse number 29. I can stand before Christ at His coming with confidence and not be ashamed. Number one, because I have abided in Him. Number two, because He is righteous. And number three, because of what verse 29 says, because I have been, leading up to that, practicing righteousness myself. We need to talk about this point. He says in verse 29, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. Now, there's a few things to unpack here. First of all, again, righteousness means to be morally right. It means to be just. It means, in essence, from our perspective, to follow the teachings of the righteous and holy book we call the Bible. And if I'm living, I can't do it with perfection, but if I'm living to the best of my ability according to the truths of God's Word, and I stand there before God on the day of judgment knowing that He is righteous and knowing that He has been my dwelling place, I look back on my life and say, my life's style has been in compliance with the will of God and I have nothing to be ashamed of as I stand here. Of course, Jesus teaches the importance in the Sermon on the Mount of doing the will of the Father. You may recall in Matthew chapter 7, 21 and following, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does what, church family? That's right. He who does the will of my Father. You see, God is concerned whether or not we are living according to the Scriptures. God is concerned whether or not we are obedient in our faith and not just have faith in word only. The Bible also says this in Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, speaking of Christ and then of us, though He were a son, yet even He, Christ, learned obedience and became obedient to the point of death, and, and here's what it says. And He is the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey Him. Yes, obeying the will of God is important. Practicing righteousness is important. And of course, here's a passage that I want you to think about in light of the second coming of Jesus Christ. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, the Bible says, To those who are weary, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and underline it, and those who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes again, He's concerned primarily with who? Who has been obeying the path of righteousness? Who has been obeying the gospel? Who has been practicing righteousness? And so I'm glad I didn't give that clock out this evening. Because maybe I couldn't finish the point. Maybe I could. It's only been a few minutes now that I see the clock. But brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, as short and simple of a passage as this is, I hope it gives you comfort. Because when Jesus comes again, whether I'm eating with the family or sitting at the desk or watching a football game or walking down the sidewalk, I will one day look up and I will hear a sound that I've never heard.
and I will see a sight that I've never seen. And though I've never witnessed a miracle because we're not currently living in the miraculous age to the best of my understanding of 1 Corinthians 13, I will then be personally involved in the final miracle that takes place on this planet earth when I will be called up into the clouds, if, and you with me, if we alive and remain in Christ, and we will have that grand reunion there in the clouds and all the former things that worried us in this life will be burned up. And we will go on to be with God forever in heaven. And the passage that talks about that says, Therefore comfort one another with these words. Are you right with the Lord this evening? Do you have the assurance that if that day were to happen right now, we would stand with confidence? If not... Why not make it right? And why not receive that assurance right now as we stand and as we sing? <clears throat> There's a fountain free to 